Uh, okay, so my name is Colin Favorito. I'm a co-founder of Voter GA, and we've been uh, a leader in the election integrity movement for about 15, 16 years here in Georgia. Okay, yeah, people are saying they can hear you, so go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, what you saw tonight was a fascinating, amazing story about voter suppression, you know, mostly in Georgia. Um, but what this movie, and the additional kind of voter suppression that we've been focusing on um, and that's the voter suppression that you can do with, by changing the votes through electronic software. And uh, that is even more devastating, as, as amazing as what you saw tonight was, uh, it's actually easier to suppress votes by simply flipping election results. And Georgia has had an unverifiable, unauditable system that's not recount capable for the last uh, 18 years, and it was recently replaced, it's actually ruled unconstitutional. I, I had brought the original claim of unconstitutionality of the machines back in 2002, uh, and uh, we took our case to the Georgia Supreme Court and lost, but then uh, the uh, machines were actually ruled unconstitutional last year in another suit federal suit by Marilyn Marks and the uh, Coalition of the Governance, they were ruled unconstitutional. So the state went out and bought a new system, spent about uh, $300 million of taxpayer money over the next um, 10 years, it's going to cost us, and yet this new system is equally as unverifiable because it places the votes in, in uh, barcodes. There are no audit procedures for the vast majority of elections. And uh, they uh, do not do a legitimate recount. They just rescan barcodes and they're going to have a recount in most cases. And that just simply reprints the previous unverifiable results. So we have an unverifiable voting system that even if you can uh, get through all of the suppression that you saw in this amazing documentary for the last you know, 45 minutes or so, you still cannot cast a vote on an auditable, uh, verifiable voting system. Um, so there are two federal lawsuits pending against the machine now, and in addition, we recently tried to view ballots because we got some suspicious vote counts up in a given county. We were denied access to to that, to the, to the ballots in order to verify the, uh, that the counts were accurate. So basically, in addition to all that, we also are conducting secret elections that have no transparency at all. So for all these reasons, Georgia has been ranked as the worst voting, uh, voting uh, system uh, state in the entire country uh, ever since 2004. And nothing has really changed much for the better. So that, that's kind of a nutshell of, of what um, has happened here, and I'm happy to take any questions from anybody on the call. Okay. Could you introduce yourself again? We had somebody come in and ask you, um, I guess, with the confusion that we had with the audio, they wanted to, they wanted to, they're asking who you were again. Yeah, and I apologize. I go on Favorito, it's, I'm the co-founder of Voter GA, and We've been the kind of more or less a leader of the election integrity movement in Georgia for uh, 15 years. But we focus mainly not so much on the type of voter suppression that you saw tonight, but it's the, the uh, voter suppression that can occur even more easily by electronic vote swapping of, of race results. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, uh, Scott, another. Um, interesting thing that they didn't really mention was the 2018 lieutenant governor's race. Yeah. In that particular race, we saw a loss of uh, about 120,000 um, votes um, that, and they also appear to be in the majority black precincts. So um, it's, 
is quite an amazing story uh, of suppression that doesn't it doesn't stop just with where the movie ends, it continues on into the realm of electronic vote counting, which, which I know you're, you're really familiar with as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to answer any questions. Okay. Um, uh, I see one. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, you, uh, people on the, um, people um, watching this, you feel free to put your questions in the chat. We'll take it from the chat mode. Uh, just yeah, click on um, the public chat if you don't see it. Uh, I've got it. There's a question here that says, how are the screens on those new machines legal? I can see how someone's voting from eight foot away. Well, that's a great point. They are not legal. Um, you have a constitutional right to cast a secret ballot, and if someone can see your vote and your screen from across the room, uh, it, you, it is not a legal vote. So the counties are scrambling to try to reposition in the, the screens and all this sort of stuff, but they don't have enough space in the precincts to do that. So essentially, uh, in many cases, they're allowing illegal votes to be cast just as the questioner has explained, um, and they're not, uh, they're just simply not upholding the law. And that's been the basis of another lawsuit uh, that's, that's been filed. So, very good point there. The, uh, the uh, specifically uh, to Ralph, well, well, there's a yeah, really bad echo. Uh, yeah, here's another question that came in with chat, uh, which is a very good question as well. Uh, and uh, they asked, are you aware of any similar issues in other states, both in the southern USA as well as northern? Well, in particular, what comes to mind is the state of South Carolina. Uh, they uh, uh, were similar to Georgia. They had uh, in, uh, unverifiable, uh, unauditable voting machines, and they uh, turned around this past election season, uh, same situation, and they bought another type of unverifiable voting system, um, again, using these, what we call the barcoded ballots, where the votes are placed into barcodes that the voter cannot verify. So if you look at the text and it says you voted for candidate A, the machine may actually record the vote for candidate B, and you would never know. And that's why we say these new systems that Georgia and South Carolina have are 100% unverifiable to the voter. Um, specifically to that point about being able to see the display from eight feet away, that was considered a positive by the people purchasing the machines for the purposes of people who are vision impaired. That's what they were trying to aim for, is that it could be seen easily by somebody who's vision impaired. The problem is they were, they were creating a system that was based on the exception versus the rule. They made the exception the rule. Rather than pick a system that works, that is secure for the majority of voters with uh, a very small number of machines that would not be able to impact the vote overall if they were hacked um, to accommodate people with vision impairment and uh, different languages. Instead, they compromise the vote for everybody. That's one of the problems. So yes, right. the fact and, that you could- see, uh, We uh, know that of course, uh, disabled people need to vote on these ballot marking devices. And, but the issue is that, um, as you said, they, they, they developed this uh, as an exception instead of the rule. So they're forcing everyone else to vote on these as well. And, uh, you know, we need handicap access, you know, for things like sidewalks and so on. But, they, you know, you're not forced to walk up the handicap uh, uh, sidewalk if you're not if you don't want to, you can take the steps. So the same should apply in in uh, voting, uh, that the uh, ballot marker marking device should produce a full ballot, which it doesn't, so that the disabled voters have equal protection with anybody that casts a mail-in vote, which is a full ballot. But uh, that the, even the disabled voters would not have uh, equal protection because these 
machines, um, only do a selection summary. Uh, in addition to having the barcode, they don't show all the referendum language. They don't show the unselected candidates. So it's not a, a, a full ballot. And, and it's, it's a really good point that they're uh, forcing all voters to vote on on what the exception should be and not the rule. By the way, for those, I didn't introduce myself, sorry. I'm Keith Watson. I'm the head of information security at the Georgia Tech College of Computing. I've been there over 30 years. I'm checking for other uh, questions here, so. Yeah, and um, I work with uh, EFGA. I really appreciate you doing Scott. this for us, guys. It's really okay. uh, good, yeah. good moving and good, uh, good questions. Um, so I work so with EFGA to review the technology and, and the laws. In fact, we put quite a bit of time in on these new voting machines. And to be blunt, the consensus of every voting security expert virtually in the country to the state of Georgia was, do not, under any circumstances, use these machines. You will have a vote that's unauditable. All of them re recommended a different system, and they said thank you, and then ignored absolutely everybody's opinion. That's exactly right, and we we had hundreds of people testify to the Safe Voting System Commission that evaluated machines and testify to the legislators at their committee hearings. We had uh, lobbyists uh, uh, on both sides of the aisle. We even had <coughs> we even had an intelligence analyst from President Trump's campaign who came in and lobbied. Uh, uh, for against these machines and for uh, you know verifiable, auditable uh, voting. So we have, uh, of course, our organization is nonpartisan, and we have many uh, Democrats and Republicans um, who agree they all want their vote to count, be audited, and verifiable. Um, so uh, you're right. I mean, they just completely I ignored uh, two years of testimony from hundreds of people. Um, somebody mentioned, talked about mail-in uh, in, in the chat, and one of the interesting things is Georgia's mail-in system is pretty good compared to other states. Um, in, uh, in the last election, Secretary of State actually mailed an, an application to all registered voters, which we thought was a great thing. Um, once you return that application, the, uh, the signature is verified. They then send the ballot out, uh, and then uh, the ballot's returned. They check the signature again. Um, you, there's no ballot harvesting allowed. You have to return your own uh, ballot unless you have uh, defined yourself as being disabled. Um, and they are, uh, they don't send live ballots to voters. They do the application process. So by most other state standards, Georgia's mailing, uh, procedures are, are pretty good. They're in fact far better than, than the, uh, electronic voting. So we are, are always recommend to, to vote by mail. Um, so what is this practice of ballot harvesting? Can you explain that a little more? Yeah, so some of the states will allow uh, anyone to turn in anybody else's ballot. And there's a lot of objections to that. Um, so in Georgia, you have to return your own ballot to the uh, elections office. Uh, or you can, of course, mail it in or, or, or drop it in a drop box for this election. So um, they, they don't allow... Um, you know, in other states, and I think California is one, anybody can turn in anybody else's ballot. So that, that leads to a uh, more possible fraud, um, which, so that problem doesn't really exist um, significantly in Georgia. Yeah, I noticed uh, over in the comments over here, there was a question about voter verifiable ballots. And, um, that's a rather technical issue, and if I can explain it simply, you've probably heard of this term risk-limiting audit. And what a risk-limiting audit does is it randomly samples ballots, and then by statistical analysis, 
determines if there's a large variance between that and the reported vote. And they continue to keep harvesting um, ballots randomly and testing them, doing this risk limiting audit until the, the error rate is so low, it determines that no more ballots need to be checked. Or if that is not reached, they end up doing a full recount. But in order for that to work, you have to have 100% verified ballots. That means every ballot must be verified by the voter. That's where the fault comes in with these ballot marking devices, which is what Georgia has. Essentially what you do is you tell the machine what you'd like to vote. It then takes that, records it, and prints it out on a piece of paper. And they say, you have the opportunity to verify your ballot. But opportunity to verify a ballot and actually verifying it are two separate things. So when you actually have a bubble form that you fill in with a pencil, we have absolute intent that when you filled in that bubble, that was the bubble you intended to fill in. Now, granted, people can make mistakes when they fill in bubbles. When you do that, you can actually destroy your ballot and ask for another one at the polling place and fill in one correctly. So you have the opportunity to verify that that ballot is actually marked exactly how you want it. So we have 100% verified ballot. However, when you go to a ballot marking machine, which is what George is using now, or be called a ballot marking device, it prints it out in a condensed form on this piece of paper. The idea is you can then take this piece of paper and verify that it actually says what you voted for. Well, they were curious as to whether or not this method was actually verifiable. Can people actually verify their ballot if they try to do so? So they ran a study and found that not only could they not do it even when they wanted to, they could find errors when there were errors and they found errors when there weren't errors. So that means that even if we could get everybody to try to verify their ballot, we still wouldn't have a 100% verified ballot. So the only actual method we know of mechanically to get a 100% verified ballot in order to do a risk limiting audit is to have those little bubble forms. Now, the additional advantage of the bubble forms is the, the readers that read those forms are relatively low tech compared to the ballot machines that we're using. And in addition, if you think that counter is wrong, you can actually take a bunch of ballots, run it through the counter, and then sit down and manually check them to see if the counts were off. So you can actually very easily verify that a one of these bubble readers is actually performing correctly. You can't do that with these ballot marking devices. In addition, the text that you verify on your ballot from on the bar, ballot marking device is not the vote of record. The barcode is the vote of record. You can't verify the barcode. You have no way, unless you have the ability to read one of these barcodes, you can't verify it. So that means even if you verify the text and you were able to verify it correctly, you still haven't verified your ballot. Now you're gonna hear this term thrown around by the politicians a lot. They say, well, we have risk limiting audits. Remember risk limiting audits are a mathematical process. And if you actually read the paper from Philip Stark who wrote the paper on risk limiting audits, he's out in the University of California. If you'd like a copy, I can send you a link to where you can get that. The um, he talks about this and, he's, and the idea is if you don't have actually verified ballots, you cannot mathematically do a risk limiting audit. It's not possible. So waiving the Jedi mind trick of risk limiting audits at a ballot marking device is like saying the Easter Bunny is going to check it out. It, it's just, it's ludicrous. But that's what they say and people accept it and they say, well, I can check my ballot. Now, how bad is this problem? Well, I remember uh, back when we got the DRE devices we have now, uh, there were those of us who fought those machines because they didn't have a paper verified ballot that came out that you could verify that it recorded what you said you wanted it to do. And I was one of those on board with, we need that verifiable ballot. It wasn't until later that when I dug into the technical details, realized that that was a red herring, that even if it had that printout, it's still not verifiable because you have to have every voter verify their ballot. 
Now, one of the other tests that they did was actually asking voters to verify their ballots. And they monitored how long they took to verify their ballots. Now, for the record, I every time I go to vote, I take an actual sample ballot that I've filled out with me and I go through and put it on the machine and then I verify that everything is marked exactly as my piece of paper says it is. Trust me, I cannot do that in under about five or 10 minutes. It takes a while. The average person took 30 seconds to verify their ballot. So what that means is even when they said they were gonna verify the ballot and were given the opportunity, they actually don't. So if they don't do it or they can't do it, you do not have 100% verified ballot. And without 100% verified ballots, you cannot do a risk limiting audit. That's a mathematical certainty. So this is all smoke and mirrors. They're waving the Jedi mind trick and pretty much everybody's falling for it. In fact, I myself originally fell for it until I dug into the details. Uh, Keith, yeah, do you want to, first of all, Keith, do you want to post the link to the, um, the risk limiting audit paper? Yeah, let me see if I can find it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Keith, that's a, you made a lot of great points there. I just want to add a couple points to what you already said. You talked about talking about audits. In Georgia, no races are going to be audited except for statewide and federal. Those are the only two types of races. So, so they're not go, you're not going to be have any audits on state house, state senate, judicial races, nonpartisan races, county races. Um, um, you know, public service commission. Uh, none of the none of these uh, races are going to be audited except for federal and statewide. And then, as you mentioned, Key, um, federal and statewide, they are planning to use a risk limiting audit process. Well, the problem is, in addition to the things that you mentioned, Key. The uh, Dr. Stark has written to the uh, Georgia election officials to say you can't use my process, which is risk limiting audit, that's his process that he defined, to audit a ballot marking device election because the, the risk limiting audit is a, uh, a post election audit and it doesn't audit what the DMD displayed to the voter. So if the DMD displayed the incorrect information like we think happened in the 2018 lieutenant governor's race, there's no way that the risk limiting audit would catch that, and there's no way that any post-election audit process would catch it. You would have to have a live parallel audit, um, and that was never written in the, in the law. The only way you could actually audit these was with a live parallel audit conducted on the equipment while the election is is going on, and that's something that elections officials have said is are just too uh, too cumbersome and not not uh, never they're not able to do. So there really is uh, no way to audit these machines uh, for the reasons that you've already explained, Keith, and as well as the ones that I have uh, unexplained. So uh, the concept that they keep saying that auditing is going to can uh, suffice for unverifiable voting equipment is, as you said, smoke and mirrors. Um, also, there's there's um, a lot of hand waving done about the difficulty of hacking these machines. Um, yeah, that's smoke and mirrors too. <laughs> yeah, that's a Jedi hand wave trick. <clears throat> there's a uh, excellent documentary made from DEFCON uh, Voter Village, uh, voting, voting Technology Village, where they actually review the technology and the hacks behind these voting machines. Um, let me see if I can find that link. You can watch the video on YouTube. Um, it's a pretty scary <laughs> in the sense that I, I'm a hacker and I run the local chapter of DEFCON here in Atlanta called DC 404. And uh, they would make want you to believe that it's difficult to do. Um, I, uh, uh, since I used to work for the military, I was on submarines and did signals intelligence and cryptography uh, during the Cold War. 
So I was a, a, an active operator uh, doing intelligence work. I can tell you that a nation state who took it upon themselves to attack the system could quite easily do it from the perspective, when I say easy, meaning it's not going to cost them $500 million to pull it off. And right. it's very doable. And, uh, Let me see if I can find the link. Yeah, Keith, there's also another uh, great link that I'm going to uh, try to find and put in the chat. And that is uh, a demonstration that pro Dr. Professor Edward Felton of Princeton gave before the United States Congress uh, of how our voting machine can be hacked. This is the one that we used to have, uh, exact same model that we use. Um, and he demonstrated how it can be hacked in about three minutes before the United States Congress the House Administration Committee. So I'll try to get that and put that in the uh, in the chat as well. Um, in the meantime, I've also got a study that we did on these ballot marking devices that will explain a lot of things about what's wrong with them. And I will put that in the chat as well. And I'm doing that right now. Okay, I found one link. Uh, this is not the documentary, but this is one of the talks at DEF CON about uh, voter system security, and they actually show hacks being done on the system. Um, so let me see if we can find that other one. Uh, yeah, and I, I put a voter GA study on ballot marking devices in there in the chat. And I'm also right now putting in the link for the um, congressional demo. And that's a YouTube video. Good. Okay. okay. That's a quick um, that's a three minute video. Interesting. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes left, by the way. So just so okay. you know. Okay. This is the report, the actual prepared report from the DEF CON Voting Village. And I'm looking for that um, video. Uh, I, I hadn't thought of having to ha it didn't occur to me to have this ready i would have had this ready in advance i'm sorry um, yeah so um while we're I'll, I'll probably go back and just mention one more time in addition that we you know we don't have verifiable we talked about on verifiability we talked about lack of auditability, um, there's no way to recount these machines because the election board has ruled that they're just going to rescan the barcode, which we never saw to begin with. So that just reprints previous unverifiable results. And then they hide the ballots. Um, the ballots are sealed and we are trying to uh, uh, get a court order now just so that we can view the ballots to verify that the election results were correct in, in a given race that had suspicious results. So on top of all that and the voter suppression, and then, you know, Georgia is conducting secret elections uh, as well, in which you have no way as the public to verify the results and audit them. So it's, it's, it's an unbelievable situation. Uh, I, I found the name of it. It's called Kill Chain. It was an HBO documentary. Um, you can find it on YouTube. That's where I watched it. it was on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, so while I was doing it, uh, a couple of questions came in. Um, it said, do you know of any groups in Georgia that are using 
the uh, Ohio IT process uh, to catch errors in the voter purge list. I am not aware of anybody using that in Georgia at the moment. Um, it's a good question, though. Um, and that came from Brian. And then Ray asked, uh, do you feel that the online absentee request is going to secure? Um, yeah, I, I, I do feel that that's reasonably secure, uh, particularly compared to the electronic system, which we know is uh, insecure, uh, completely insecure for a lot of the reasons that both Keith and I have already explained. So uh, we always recommend voting uh, absentee, vote by mail. Uh, it looks, well, wait a minute. Um, here's an article about it from Wired, about the documentary called Kill Chain. Um, and it is available online. I'm not, uh, I watched it, gosh, probably two weeks ago. Um, so it, it was available. It may not be online. It was done by HBO, and it may not be available anymore. We'll see. Um, maybe Canary can find it. Canary is very good at finding these things. Uh-huh. Um, uh, oh, wait a minute. I found it. I found it. Here we go. Another question came in while we're waiting. Um, is there a way that you could force the Georgia government to have to take a random sample of ballots and scan them and, and call the voter to confirm the barcode is giving the right code? Well, uh, a couple of points there. First of all, you can't, uh, the voter has a nominee, uh, so you don't know who cast the ballot. So you couldn't call the voter. However, this point still valid that what the election officials could view the ballot themselves and make sure that the ballot um, is, uh, you know, this, what the text that's on the ballot matches the barcode. The problem is this barcode is encrypted. Um, so it's very difficult to do. So they have to run this through and get a count and then verify the counts of the, the text of the ballot and see if they add up to the what the voting uh, counts are. So that's the way that you would confirm that the text and the barcode are matching correctly. But that's not being done, as I mentioned earlier, in any of the local races. That means uh, Georgia State, uh, Georgia State House, State Senate, Judicial, Nonpartisan County. Uh, none of those races will have that type of audit, so you'll never know. Um, and that's a real, real serious problem. Uh, and you would only know through the uh, auditing of the statewide and federal races, but there's such a small sampling of those, uh, it's, and the process is not proper either. The risk of the audit process really is not, does not work according to Dr. Stark. So the bottom line is that auditing is wholly inadequate to verify that their barcodes have accurate information in them. Apparently, uh, that video was, it's, it, you can watch it at HBO. Um, it was on YouTube for a period of time, which is when I watch it. It doesn't appear to be up there anymore. Um, it's still possible it's floating out there in the Ethernet somewhere and we can find it. Okay, we got another question from Brian. Okay. Oh, um, I don't, I don't, I haven't heard about that. So I don't know. Uh, Garland, do you have any input on Brian C's question? He says, the recent court ruling that directs yeah. Georgia to accept yeah. Maryland Palace. But, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm going I'm to I'm answer Ray's question first because that's really an easy, quick one. Uh, they, they're starting to uh, count the absentee vote uh, two Mondays 
before the um, election day. So, so um, it would be, it, it, it was Monday a week before, and now they've made it Monday two weeks before. So that's when they start opening the election, the ballots and verifying the signatures and so on. Or uh, verifying the signatures. And then they, uh, I think they start the scanning process as well. Um, so that's a great question. Brian's a little bit more complicated. Um, what, any idea of the likelihood of this the court case being upheld that directs Georgia to accept mail-in ballots postmark before the election and be, actually they can accept it three days after. Um, yeah, I, I think that Georgia uh, is, would be appealing that um, and uh, it, it creates a problem, it kind of holds up certification. So I think, although they have expanded certification to allow them to have 10 days after the election, um, you know, there's no real hurry to get the, the cert, you know, certified results. You just want to make sure that the results are right. That's the most important thing. Um, so, but yeah, I, I would expect Georgia to appeal that. Um, and it, 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 it's hard to say which way that will go. I would, my guess is that the, the, uh, they might win that on appeal, but it's, it's just hard to say. But yeah, I would expect that to be appealed. Um, another thing you can do, and this this is something that um, Canary and Rubix uh, uh, 1138 were talking about on the Discord, is you can in Georgia go to this URL I posted, and you can put in your information, and it'll pull up your registration and tell you if you're currently registered, and tell you where your voting poll is. You can print a voter registration card so that you can take it with you, so you can show that this is what the website said. It'll also tell you all your district, uh, what district you're in, who your representatives are, all that sort of thing. The other interesting thing is if you've applied for an absentee ballot, in the bottom left corner of the page, you can click on a link there and it'll tell you if you were, well, it'll tell you if they've received your absentee ballot and if they've actually uh, process your paperwork. And if it has, you can actually click on a link there. It'll give you additional information about your registration for an absentee ballot. I just found that out today. Um, I was surprised to find that my absentee ballot registrations were not accepted. So for me and my wife. So uh, we're going to have to do them again. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the My Voter page that is really a handy tool. Um, I think you just enter your birth date, last name, and county, and it will pop up your records. Um, but the, the we, have, we have noticed that the information there is sometimes inaccurate uh, in terms of ballot tracking. But it's a great, you know, the, the concept was a good idea so that you could track the status of your ballot, uh, your absentee ballot request, and your submission. Um, I just don't, I don't think the information is totally trustworthy yet. Um, oh, I, I, yeah. That, that posted thank the link. You. Yeah, Cynthia posted where you can register online to vote. Um, that's also a very handy link. Thank you for that, Cynthia. The uh, also, uh, Guggenai, it looks like is, I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, yeah, you're asking about all the changes uh, to the post office if that's going to affect. Uh, mail-in ballots, uh, ballots, and there's a lot of uh, questions about that. Part of the problem is that the entire thing about the post office is highly politicized, so actually getting the information about its impact on the ballots has been rather problematic. The um, postmaster general, in, when he was talking to Congress, when they said, um, you need more money. And he said, no, we're actually good. We're doing okay. And they said, no, no, you need more money. You don't have enough money to do what you're doing. So, so that lent this narrative that they don't have the resources to be able to process all this stuff. Whereas the Postmaster General is denying that and saying, no, no, we're good. We, we can do this. Um, there's been also some concern over the decommissioning of some um, mail processing equipment that was decommissioned. 
Part of that is due to the change in the load, in my understanding, change in the load of mail that the, the post office is processing. They're moving more towards packages lately because of the, yeah, I'm sorry, Brian, there is an echo. Um, there's, they're moving more toward packages and delivering packages. In fact, they've got a contract with Amazon to do a lot of packages, and the amount of actual physical mail is going progressively lower because we're relying on physical mail less and less. So there's separating the facts from the fiction and the political spin has been extremely difficult. It's right now it's very fuzzy. So from my opinion, the jury's out on the impact it's going to have on absentee ballots. Now as an elderly elder person, uh, you're looking at me and you're saying, I can't be that old. I understand technology and uh, all the clocks in my house don't believe 12 perpetual. Um, just to let people know, uh, most of the people that are here didn't probably invent the technology we're using right now. It's all this old guys have all this stuff. So, <laughs> Garland gets it. <laughs> um, so anyway, the um, I'm I'm concerned because I'm high risk for COVID. And I'm, my concern is I don't know that I'm going to be able to physically, safely, physically go vote. So being able to have that for me is really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, okay, I want to get, also want to hit Ray's question real quick. She mentioned about her polling locations changed twice this year, and she never got an absentee ballot. I know uh, Fulton County had, I don't know if Ray's in Fulton County, but there was a, a ton of problems uh, with Fulton. In fact, they uh, actually are in a uh, in investigation by the Attorney General's office right now as to lots of people did not get their absentee ballot in time. I waited months for mine. I literally, it took me over two months to get my absentee ballot um, with Fulton. So that, I'm not sure which county raised in, but. Yeah, she didn't fall. Yeah, yeah, raising fall. So uh, that's probably part of the reason for nothing. Yeah, there's yeah, some yeah, yeah. really good questions you have. Going back and looking at them, I'm making sure we got them all covered. Yeah, I I do need to start kind of wrapping things up for the night. So if we want to have a okay. Uh, like a uh, kind of uh, final word here. Garland, do you want to go ahead? Um, well, I want to say, uh, Scott, thanks for putting this on. This is an a interesting way uh, to do Dragon Con. So <laughs> you have to do it remote. So yeah. I did actually wear my Olympic shirt here from <laughs> to be in, in costume. So, but uh, I, I thank you for putting this on, and thanks uh, for all the good questions that came in from the audience. So, yeah, thanks to the audience. Uh, if, if you need more information, just go out to VoterGA.org, and there's a ton of information out there. Okay, and then Keith? Um, I, I really want to thank the people who joined us tonight. It's very it's hard very to see that there's a lot of other people, people out there that, that actually, actually care, about care about this. this. When we're fighting, we're fighting the, the government, government over this, uh, this. with the EFGA, we sometimes feel like we're lonely warriors out there tilting at windmills. So seeing that there's other people who are interested in this and um, uh, looking into this and paying careful attention to this, there were a lot of great uh, links that were shared by some of the people who uh, were here tonight. So I appreciate that. Thank you. So um, keep up the good work, keep up the good fight. Um, we only have freedom if we continue to vigilantly defend it. And that means watching the government and watching uh, what they do like a hawk. That's the founding principles that our government was based on and we need to continue doing that today. We cannot just rest on our laurels. We have to do this in a day in day out battle. Okay, well, thanks very much. I. Uh... Uh, and thanks to the audience, too. I need to go ahead and wrap up for the evening. If you'd like to continue the discussion, uh, please come over to the uh, Discord server, and uh, we'll continue it there. Um, let me get the Discord instructions. Hang on just a second. Right here. And here's the Discord instructions. 
So if you want to continue the conversation, it'd be great uh, if you can come out there. I don't know if uh, Garland, I don't know if you have any time to to jump over on the Discord or not, but uh, if you want to do that at some point in the weekend, that'd be great. Oh, all right. Thank you, uh, Scott. Um, I'll, I'll look for it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to have to close it down uh, now. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, and I'll talk to you okay. later. Thanks for doing it, Scott. Okay. All Bye. Right. Thank Bye. you. Have a good evening. Bye.